Eevee fans love to hate this technology. It's like catnip to a lot of you, or a dog to a good crotch. It's just that a lot of Eevee fans enjoy hating on plug-in hybrids. And until very recently, I was completely one of them. I just didn't get it. Look, the plug-in hybrid does have a lot of problems, at least on paper. First and foremost being that the range is typically a lot less than a fully battery electric vehicle. And then you've got the matter that plug-in hybrids are typically a lot less fun to drive than a battery electric. And also the fact that you have two powertrains to maintain, and then there's the argument to be made, well, this is not a great electric car because you're lugging around a huge gas engine, and it's not a great gas car because you're lugging around a huge battery. But thankfully, we don't drive cars on paper, we drive them on the road, or in this case, the snow and ice. According to recent data, the average US commute is up to 41 miles as of 2023. Now that's not to say people don't commute more, and I'm sure there's that person in the comment that's gonna say, I drive 200 miles up hills both ways towing a trailer. Well, of course, then an EV or really a PHEV or, well, a lot of vehicles probably aren't for you. But a range of 40 miles should be enough for most US consumers to at least commute to and from work on electricity alone. Now this Outlander p is rated at 38 miles, which is okay. It's not 50, it's not 60, it's not quite as many as like the RAV4 Prime, but it's okay. And when the charge is depleted, a 14.8 gallon tank will take you an estimated 382 miles before the tank needs refueling, which if you're an EV person can take as little as three minutes. Okay, that's a joke. I love EVs, don't, don't send your hate mail. Now it is true, many plug-in hybrids are pretty mad to drive, especially when the gasoline engine isn't helping out. But not all plug-in hybrids are built alike, and Mitsubishi is doing something a little bit unusual with the Outlander. There are really three different types of plug-in hybrid all-wheel drive systems that Mitsubishi has identified in their competitive set. The first is a system like Hyundai uses, where you have an electric motor alongside a traditional automatic transmission. Then there's the Toyota system, which uses a planetary gear set and a separate electric motor at the rear end. And then there's a the Mitsubishi system, which operates a lot like the old Chevrolet Volt. Under normal situations, the engine actually acts like a generator to supply electricity to the electric motors, which means this car drives a lot more like an electric car than, for example, a Toyota or a Hyundai. And then, of course, under very specific steady state cruising speeds, the engine can go into a direct drive right to the wheels. What this means is the Outlander PHEV drives a lot more like an EV than a lot of its competitors, and it even has a more powerful rear motor than front motor, so you can get a very unique driving experience in this Outlander compared to something like a RAV4 Prime or the Hyundai plug-in hybrids. Now, what about horsepower? Well, the Outlander PHEV is rated at 248 horsepower, but what's interesting is 114 horsepower comes from the front wheels and 134 comes from the back, so it's actually a rear bias setup. It is very true that this Outlander has two powertrains to maintain. Now, in theory, the electric side of things is gonna be very maintenance-free, but it does have that gasoline engine, which does go through maintenance cycles. It will need oil change, but consumer reports of Mitsubishi say they estimate about a 50% reduction in maintenance cost over the lifespan of the vehicle by going with the BHEV compared to a traditional internal combustion engine. Now, what about the argument that a plug-in hybrid vehicle is not a great EV and it's not a great gas car? Well, I think that argument is 100% true and also completely false because much like humans, PHEVs are flawed, but they work a lot better for a lot more people. So I recently, last summer, I did this adventure where we drove from Disney to Disney across country in one go in a Tesla Model 3. And yes, we could do it. Yes, it was fairly easy in terms of finding chargers and that kind of thing, but it sucked. It was a long trip, and after like the 10th charging stop, how badly did I just want to go up to a gas station and put gas in the car and be on my way? And with a PHEV, you can do it. In my mind, you really, really need one thing in order for a car like this to work in your lifestyle. You gotta have either a place to charge at home or a place to charge at work. If you can do that, this car makes a lot of sense for most Americans. 
You can run it on that cheap electricity, never engage that gasoline engine, don't need to worry about nearly as much maintenance with that gasoline engine, and just drive it on electricity. And then when you go on the road trip, kick on that gas engine and fill up at the gas pump. And I really, I have a hard time when EV folks hate on plug-in hybrids because oftentimes they dismiss them as like a, a stepping stone to the fully electric. I'm fine if this is the final solution. This is a great solution. This would still have a huge environmental savings over a normal gasoline vehicle. And I, I just love them. They really make a ton of sense to me now that I've lived with one, now that I've road tripped more extensively in an electric car. It just sucks. You know, the infrastructure is growing, the vehicles are getting better, but it still sucks. Gasoline is still the king of road tripping. Electric is still the king around town. Why not have both? This is, this is fine. This is great. Well, enough talking about plug-in hybrids in general. Let's talk specifics around the Outlander plug-in hybrid. Is this a good car? Well, as spec, we're looking at $51,835, and it does not qualify for the federal $7,500 tax credit. First and foremost, because it's not made here in the US. Of course, if you lease it, you can get some of that money back, which is great. Now, this vehicle does share its platform with the Nissan Rogue, but it looks very different. It's a super unique look Mitsubishi compared to the Nissan. I love the Outlander spelled out across the hood there, very Range Rover. Now, a lot of these cars do come specs with a ton of chrome around the front end, which is not everyone's taste, but there is a available blackout package, which dims all that chrome to black and kind of gives it a more sinister look, which I might consider if it was my car. Now we're rolling on a set of 20 inch wheels, a unique two-tone design, 255-45R20s wrapped in this case in the Yokohama Blue Earth Winter Tire. We are up here in Canada actually for this shoot. Um, all the numbers I'm giving you are it for the US market though, because that's where most of you guys live out there. But um, love in Montreal, Canada, it's very cold. My, my hands are very freezing and I apologize for the goofy hat. <laughs> now coming along the side, of course the Outlander can be had in both internal combustion and plug-in hybrid. Easiest way to tell is that huge plug-in hybrid EV badge there on the side of the car. You can spec this vehicle in a two-tone roof definitely look into that. I think it's a super attractive design. And they also have this little bit of a blackout element here, which gives it a floating roof effect, almost like a little bit of a pagoda effect. Out back tail lights look fairly similar to the outgoing Outlander with a little bit of a, a, a nod to the future there, of course. We've got PHEV badging up back, super all wheel control spelled out proudly. And then Outlander on the left side of the tailgate, I don't love these. I think they're trying to mimic exhaust ports, but they don't, they don't do much for the look for me. But overall, it's a pretty attractive looking car. Now let's talk about some of the specs to charging that kind of thing. Well, it's got a 20 kilowatt hour battery, which kind of lives around here in the center of the car. And it's charged here on the passenger side. We'll pop that door open. There we go. And the first thing you notice when you pop that open is a unique charging setup. So we actually have two different ports. We have a level one and level two home charging port or AC charging port. And then we have a level three Chatamo port. That's right, the Outlander plug-in is one of the few hybrids that you can DC fast charge. Now it doesn't do it super quick. It's like zero to 80% in roughly 25 minutes. Considering it's only a 20 kilowatt hour battery, that's not super quick. And I've talked to a bunch of Outlander PHEV owners who have reached out to me and it sounds like very few of them actually use the DC fast charging port. But apart from Mercedes has an option, Range Rover has an option, very few plug-in hybrids have that. So that's a must, it is there. It's also Chatamo, which is kind of an old standard. And then the AC charging port, unfortunately the level two rate is pretty slow, 3.3 kilowatts. You know, Toyota will do 6.6 .6 in the Prime. They gotta up that, it's a little slow. It should still charge the battery overnight, but come on Mitsubishi, you gotta up the game a little bit there. Now let's hop on the inside. And this really is the big surprise of the Outlander. You look, 52 grand or thereabouts for Mitsubishi does sound like a lot of money, but they have really incorporated a lot of premium materials and features in here. Look at the diamond stitching everywhere. Now, of course, lower trims aren't going to have it, but it's a great look and it's got a contrasting white finish. Absolutely beautiful. Nice bolstering on the seat sides too, also in that contrasting finish. And the quality materials on the inside. Guys, Mitsubishi is really up in their games. Now, a lot of this design is, of course, Nissan. So maybe I should say Nissan and Mitsubishi are upping their games. But let's go ahead and start this car up. Power button there. It's going to beep into life. Nine inch display. Doesn't sound huge, but what I love about it, it's got volume, 
and two nubs. Wow, what a concept. And shortcut buttons along the side, and I think the colors look really good, right? Look at that. Pretty crisp display, pretty quick, easy to use, wireless Apple CarPlay, I believe wired Android Auto. Now, the switch quality feels pretty good, much better than previous Outlanders. The old Outlander plug-in hybrid had a rather inappropriate, I think I'll leave it at there, looking shifter. The new one has gone to this little square blob. It works okay, not much to talk about there. We do have physical climate controls as well. So it's all in Celsius, not in freedom units, folks, but um, really easy to use and understand. Uh, two zone, driver and passenger. Heated steering wheel button there, heated seats on this trim. And I like the steering wheel with the perforated material. That feels really, really good. I also like this silver material. Now here is something a little interesting. We have the, the drive select knob for that super all wheel control setup. We can go between different drive modes and if this door was fully closed, you might be able to see a little bit of an animation there on the screen. No, it's gonna make me start the car up. But what's cool about that is it really does change the character and this red dot, something a little special. That is, um, we'll talk about in a second, but Mitsubishi for this program only has programmed in a drive mode because they have complete control of front to rear motors because they're not attached. They have simulated a more front wheel drive bias setup <coughs> Toyota Prime. Um, so we get a, a sense of what this vehicle would drive like compared to one of its competitors, which is kind of, uh, kind of an interesting move there, Mitsubishi. I'm glad that you're, you're confident in your, in your decisions there. Um, okay, so some other things we're talking about. Fully digital gauge cluster. Once again, easy to read. Looks pretty good. A little bit of configurability here as well. You can control it. Oh, there we go. Now we can maybe see the different modes. Okay, there we go. Yeah, look at that. Looks good. I like that. Go through different settings there. Quite nice. We can also uh, use this little screen to go through some of the different options. Here we have um, some driver assistance technology, of course, adaptive cruise control, um, that kind of thing, blind spot monitoring. Very, very nice. And then a decent sized sunroof, not all the way to the full back of the car, but it's a good size. And we do have open as well as electric shade control. All right, let's hop into the rear seat, see what that has to offer. Now I am six feet tall. I do apologize for some of the videography. I'm just by myself today. Go into my driving position, which is right here. Get behind myself. Okay, so legroom is very good. I'd say, ah, I would give it a seven out of 10. I got enough. Headroom with the sunroof, it's not very good. Yeah, it needs to be a little better uh, if I was to comfortably sit back here. Shorter passengers, not gonna have an issue. A little bit of a stadium seating effect too, where you kind of look over you know, the front passengers, but not, not enough headroom. And then we also have our controls back here for the heated seats and the third zone of climate control. And I like the little shade. And once again, guys, that, that stitch diamond quilting continues. Now we're gonna try something a little bit different here. And I've never done this on camera before, but we're gonna try to access the third row. And let's see how this works. I'm gonna try to do this with one hand. So let's do one like this. It's a little heavy with one hand, but very doable and two like that. That's right, you can get this vehicle with a third row. It's also one of the few electrified vehicles with the third row. There are a couple, but not many. And let's see if that third row is actually usable. Second row is okay. So third row, let me see if we got any kind of, we do have some slides, so let's, let's slide this into a reasonable position. Here, fold down the seats. Okay, immediately my foot's kind of fighting me a little. Oh boy. Okay, yep, I would describe this third row, that, that's, a, that's a child's only third row. Yeah, that's a rather unfortunate amount of leg room. Luckily that person's got, look, with my legs sort of, sort of comfortable, that person's doing okay. Not great, but okay, but yeah, it's a small third row. But look, look, folks, some folks just want it in a pinch in an emergency. You got some colleagues to take to lunch. Let's see if I can do this without slipping on my butt. You know, some folks just need that little peace of mind of having a third row. And that's really uh, what that's for. Let's see if the fold down should be the reverse of kind of how we got it in there. Oh, here we go, three. This might be a two hand operation. Oh, we were able to make that work. Okay, pretty cool. So we were able to make that work. Now trunk space in the Outlander. It's very good, lots of good room back here. Put that seat back to where it was. Also has a nice little bit of recline. Good trunk space. We can also fold the seats 
from the trunk, which is good. Looks like they do fold pretty flat. And then we have a 1500 watt inverter in this PHEV as well. So you, you, that's actually a good amount. Some of the Toyota products that are like 400 watts, 1.5 kW kilowatts is pretty good. All right, let's close this thing up and talk about it. Look folks, I, the Outlander, I would say from a lot of the automotive journalist community doesn't get a lot of the respect it deserves. I personally like it. I like the way the hybrid system works. I like the plug-in option. I'm even kind of drawn into the DC charging thing. I know it's not super useful, but it's kind of fun. No, car is on. Well, let me open it up. And it's got a really nice cabin. So look, it's not perfect. It's a little weird looking. Third row is tiny, but it is unique. And in a class where every small crossover is virtually the same, having something unique is a win in my book. Now this Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid handles very differently than other plug-in hybrids on the market because it's got a very powerful rear electric motor. It's actually more powerful than the front electric motor and the super all-wheel control also has a very sophisticated set of yaw sensors and they can distribute torque front and back in any situation and they can also change it based on the mode you're in. So right now I'm in this constant radius circle in the snow mode and it's giving me a very controlled radius around this turn. It's not pushing, it's not oversteering. As they go a little bit too fast, it of course will revert to some understeer. But depending on the mode, I can not only change the traction control programming, but the all-wheel drive torque distribution because of the yaw sensors to really change the character on snow and ice. And right now I'm on the all-season tires and you really see a big difference in the modes um, between uh, your, your, your snow mode, your power mode, and your normal mode. Driving the Outlander PHEV, this car drives a lot like a fully electric vehicle in that you have instant response at pretty much any speed. There's no need for an engine to spool up. And that's because it really is an electric vehicle with a gasoline engine to generate some electricity, except when you're steady state on the highway, then it can operate on the gasoline engine as a direct drive. But for the most part, response is good. It's, uh, you look, they, they say it's, 248 horsepower, which is quite a bit less than like the RAV4 Prime, but straight line acceleration and the rest of it feel very adequate and feel pretty good. This car does have a number of different drive modes as part of that SAWC all-wheel drive system, and they have a special mode program for us today with a red dot. And this red dot mode is a much more front wheel biased setup, like you would find in a Toyota RAV4 Prime. And if you read between the lines, that's kind of what they're going for here is what some of the competitive set drives like in this special mode. The Outlander plug-in hybrid has a couple things which are a bit of a head scratcher. Now, first of all, we have a number of different modes, EV modes. So we've got normal, which will prioritize EV until the gas engine needs to kick on. EV, which it prioritizes electric mode. Save, which saves battery and charge, which charges it as you drive along. Um, it's, in my opinion, it makes sense because I'm a car person. If you're not a car enthusiast, I could see this being a little confusing. I mean, in my mind, there really should probably be EV and hybrid, maybe a save, but having a save and a charge just seems a little redundant. And the one pedal thing is okay. So you actually have five different region modes which you activate with the paddle shifters, B1 through five, B5 is the most aggressive. And then there's an innovative pedal button, which the engineer said is kind of like B10. So it's the strongest region and it also incorporates some friction brakes, but it doesn't bring you to a full stop. And regardless of the mode, it has creep and Mitsubishi will tell you it's because they don't want to reinvent the wheel for a buyer. They want it to kind of replicate a gas car. This is the stepping stone into an EV, which I think is a bad idea. Personally, I would like Innovative Pedal to come to a complete stop, leave the creep on B1 through 5, but they've decided to, to do what they've done. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, it is what it is. Now look, the Outlander PHEV is by no means as fun to drive as a full EV, and it does have its compromises, like that teeny tiny third row, and of course the fact that it doesn't qualify for the $7,500 federal tax credit. However, you can lease this car, as something like 66% of Americans do, and receive you know some of that money back and there are a lot of great attributes to driving this car of course the rear drive bias the differences the mode
load makes to the driving experience from a traction control and a yaw standpoint. Plus it's one of the few plug-in hybrids that has a DC fast charging option, which is really, really neat. Well, folks, I'd love to know what you think in the comments section below. Am I way off my rocker for liking plug-in hybrids or should we be full EVs all the time? I'd love to hear your perspective. And as always, this has been Tommy. We'll see you on another episode. Head over to alttfl.com for the latest and greatest in new car reviews.